so I was on your live last week. So why right. don't you uh, talk to the people, introduce yourself real quick, uh, since, since you're on my live this week. This is what I do now. <laughs> All right, so guys, uh, I'm Dr. Norton. I am a therapist in the Hampton, uh, Virginia area. I'm also a professor at Hampton University. Uh, I teach right. in a graduate school for people who are uh, pursuing uh, careers in counseling. So whether that's therapy or they want to be school counselors or different things of that nature. Um, so as I was saying, I'm a therapist. I also have my own mental health agency in the Virginia area. So we do outpatient, we do groups, and um, we're in the process of getting credential for some community support. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Uh, me and Dr. Hopkins, we go back a while from undergrad. Um, we both had a chance to that's go right, to man. the same uh, graduate school, different programs. But, you know, that's where we, we kind of had a chance to, to mesh and bond and just collaborate. So right, right. So goal here is we want to collaborate and, you know, give, give the people some value, especially during this uh, pandemic. Right, right, right. So, um, right, we know, we know each other back from our Hampton days, man. HBCUs, so important. A lot of love there. Those bonds last a long time. Shout We're out proof that. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll share quickly for people who are new to my page. I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, I have an office in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. I work with adolescents and adults. I'm, I'm, I, and I do individual therapy as, as well as... Uh, um, counseling therapy and more family therapy as of late. It's, you know, the, the quarantine has been really hard on our couples, man. It was on your live last week. We talked about how, right, domestic violence rates are way up. Um, I know my, my uh, brother who is a um, public defender in Queens, like a lot of the, the um, cases that he's handling are in regards to domestic violence. So, you know, couples are really going through a lot. So there's a lot of situations that are being exacerbated between um, partners these days because of the close quarters. Uh, and so I've been seeing that a lot as well as my practice too. But uh, I'm kind of a journalist. I work a lot with people with depression and, and trauma as well, and also people of color um, and, uh, and understanding the unique experiences that we go through. And so speaking of which, all right, that, that takes us into our topic for today, right? Like we, um, we want to get, we want to, we want to get into uh, what it's like working while black from home. Right. And so before we get into it, I want to, I want to kind of set the stage uh, for our conversation a little bit, right. There's a couple of things that I wanted to, to share. Uh, Norton, you always know, like, I, I like, I like looking stuff up. So um, yeah. I, I did, I did a little bit of legwork. And so a couple of things I want to share with you all, right. Cause I think it's important that we get into a little bit of like, just talking about what it's like working while black in general first and foremost and then we can kind of go go like more specific into working from home while black but one one of the things that's always been challenging is that there has literally always almost always been i will say actually always been an uh an un an employment disparity in our country literally it's one of the most robust statistics in when it comes to to employment um research is that uh blacks in the united states um have always had roughly double the amount of unemployment than that of their white counterpoints. I mean, and this is going back to 40s and 50s, literally up till today, right? Even in the recent, even prior to COVID, like as of uh, the last couple of years or two, right? When the unemployment rate was hitting an historical low, the unemployment rate for black folks was still twice that of our white, white counterparts. So even when we're flourishing jobs wise, right? There's, you're typically, Right, we are um, we rank the highest among the the unemployed, right? And so, why is that? And like people have researched this, right? There was a study called "Last Hired, First Fired?" Question mark Black White Unemployment and Business Cycle. Uh, this was done in like 2010, but and it looked at for for a few years and from like 2000 from 84 to like early 2000s about like why that might be that blacks are represented among the unemployment. And it's not so much that we're the last hired, but we typically are the first fired. Or let go or laid off. Or let go or laid off or right. furloughed, right? So that, that statistic for decades, right? As long as, right, you go, you go as far back as you'd like, there's always been that double, we've always been unemployed at double the rates of our white counterparts. A large part of it is because we're the first to be fired uh, or let go or furloughed, so on and so forth. 
And, um, you know, in the, the Atlantic a while back, actually, it was a 2015 article, they talked about how, right, when you're, as a Black employee, your mistakes um, are scrutinized way more than your white counterparts, right? And, and there are even... Employee. I think that's just... You know, we know that off top. Yeah, I, yeah. I think <laughs> yeah, outside of employment, behaviors are definitely scrutinized a, a lot more to our, our white counterparts for sure. Absolutely, um, and I think they, that article also spoke to right. We didn't need an article to tell us this, right? But it also spoke to that there are mistakes that we will make that are recognized even when. Um, Whereas our white counterparts, those mistakes aren't recognized because in general, we're scrutinized more. So we're, our mistakes are likely to be recognized more as well, which means we'll get lower performance ratings, which means lower income, right? It's just a trickle down effect. But first, at first glance, there's always that, um, there's always that sense that we're going to be scrutinized more. So let's just talk about that, man. Maybe that we, could, we can kind of start there and um, yeah. just give some voice to what it's like for working while, ba working while black and... Yeah. Um, for, for sure. So I'm, I'll start off. Um, so just let's talk microaggressions, right? So when we have high positions, we tend to have an imposter syndrome, right? So it's like, I'm in this position, uh, you know, depending on your coworkers or, or the environment that you're in, but you can uh, kind of second guess your, your full value and your competencies and things of that nature. But on the flip side, when we're at lower positions, which we tend to start at, it's kind of like this glass ceiling. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, when we're, we're, we're climbing the ladder, it's a glass ceiling. But once we reach the, the point that, I don't want to say the point we want to get to, but the point to where we're in our professional career, you know, it's definitely those uh, microaggressions. It's the imposter syndrome, all, all that stuff. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you from experience. So before I started my agency, um, Working at Hampton, HBCU, not a lot of microaggressions, right? Everyone looks like me, students look like me, administration, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I had an uh, opportunity to work at the hospital. I probably worked at the hospital about four years. Um, so inpatient psych, uh, psychiatric assessments, all of those things. And uh, the, the imposter syndrome, it, I say scale of one to 10, it was about a six, but it's just the interactions. I can't necessarily pinpoint you know, uh, what someone said or what someone did, but you could just kind of feel the interaction. You know, I'm young, I'm black, I have a doctorate. Mm -hmm. um, that could be intimidating to a lot of people. And a lot of people try to downplay certain things. Um, mm -hmm. So I think from, from a scope of uh, being young black professionals, we, we definitely run into a lot of uh, microaggressions, a lot of uh, scrutiny and our mistakes, as you were saying from the article, uh, are scrutinized a, a lot at, at a way grand, grander scale than, than yeah. Our and Sh Char Newman also commented that in addition to being scrutinized more, right, our our um, our um, our ability, our talents, right, the things that we're we're good at may not be equally rewarded, right. A good a good friend of mine mentioned how he's come up with some really great topics at work. And it wasn't until his white peers mentioned those same ideas, those same topics, then were they um, received as well. And, you know, you, you, would, you had mentioned, um, you had mentioned uh, imposter syndrome. Do you want to uh, break that down for the people real quick? Yeah, yeah. So imposter syndrome is when you are at a position in your career that, that you've worked hard for, right? So you have the experience, you have the education, uh, you're knowledgeable, but there's a void in yourself. It's more of a lack of confidence, I would say. It's it's down down the street of confidence to where, um, you know, you're fulfilling your duties. You could be doing a, a great job, but in your mind, you feel like you're not reaching your potential. You're not doing as as good as you can. You feel like you're in this position. It could be, you know, because of affirmative action. It could be, you know, because they they didn't have anyone else. But you start to scrutinize or second guess. Um, how you even got into the position. And that, that has, uh, you know, uh, monumental effects on, on your work performance, on your, uh, the value of yourself as an employee and just, yeah, your overall professional development. And your level of uh, comfort um, just in the position, right? Um, and there, so t to your point too, uh, Norton, right, there are, there are so many things that eat at our, 
eat at our sense of value as black workers, right? Like we'll have colleagues again, who may, uh, may not recognize us who highlight our, um, or superiors who, uh, highlight, who highlight our mistakes. And, um, really what we, um, Right, or attribute our success to other things, right? Question our validity in certain positions to affirmative action and things like that, not recognizing, right, that affirmative action in context is to prevent racist folks from enacting certain racist ideals that would prevent us from, from being, from attaining the jobs that we are well, more than um, competent um, to have, right? Because we, we have the research to support that well, if there weren't certain policies in place for, to, to allow us to get certain positions, then we likely would not. And even though those policies are, play, are in place, they're still inadequate because that we have that employment disparity that is so damn robust over the in- history of our country. Um, additionally, to the things that you shared, there's something I always talk about when it comes to this, like working while Black, is this idea of the white gaze. Like, and what I mean by that is G-A-Z-E, like, when, like, the, you know that a white person at work is viewing you, observing you, right? Can we keep it real in here? Yeah, can we, can we <laughs> just, <laughs> this is for us, right? This is for us. Uh, when, there's, there's this, there's something that intuitively happens for us that's quite instinctual when we know that a white person in the workplace is viewing us. Stay on your back. Right. right. There's something like it. We, we, right. We know to, um, we might code switch. Right. Uh, right. We know what code switching is. Code switching is when we, um, we, we kind of switch to this different way of being, of speaking, of carrying ourselves, our body language, even our dress, right. The way that we present ourselves, uh, aesthetically, right. It shifts to accommodate the, the cultural values of the environment or the, the op, what we imagine what might be more appealing in the eyes of the viewer. Mm-hmm. Um, we start to pull back some other things that we might naturally do a little bit more because we recognize that again, it's going to be criticized or harshly viewed from the one who is observing. There's something in, just instinctually that happens within us that we augment when we know that there's a white person that's looking at us. There's discomfort there, there's anxiety. It, it may not rise to the level of a diagnosable disorder, but yeah, our heart rate goes up a little bit more. We, we learn to brace, right? Our, muscle, our muscles may, t- may tense, right? Like we, we start to kind of, um, we, we, we're aware. We become really, really aware. And, and, and the, I'm sorry, not to cut you off, but I think it gets heightened. So I feel like as black professionals with the white gaze, if we, in my mind, this is just from my experience, I've always felt it's like if you stay somewhere between like average and under average, you'll get a little less, less um, attention. If you overperform, it's the the white gaze is strong. If you're underperforming, you know, it's it's even stronger. So for me it was always this balance of, you know, doing what I have to do, you know, making making sure I'm 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 serving the company but not being the 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 top performer. It's like somewhere between like, you know, under average and average performance. Yeah, I think I think where that gets really tricky, right, is that I think when it comes down to right, another Another way of thinking about this is, right, when we're mindful of that gaze and, like, then we code switch is, like, W.E.B. Du Bois's idea of double consciousness, mm-hmm. right? It's like you always, right, what he says is always looking at oneself through the eyes of the other. And, like, why, like, looking at ourselves, like, envisioning ourselves, imagining what our white boss would view, how they would view and observe us. And then why is it that we do that? Well, it's because there's a hierarchy of power, right? There's a disposition. There is a disparity of power and they can make decisions that invariably affect your livelihood, your family, so on and so forth. Right. And so right to your um, to what you were saying a moment ago is that then we, we kind of augment to accommodate them. And I think it gets tricky. This idea of kind of performing well, but not too well. is because there is that sense that performing too well for some right in some white spaces that performing too well is going to rub people the wrong way or there's going to be a fear that's inside it. Or, um, 
But if you don't perform well enough, right? We already talked about the the stats at the at the beginning of the show. Right. Your ass is going to get fired. You out of here. You're you'll, you'll be the you'll be the first to go. Like right. there's literal what I, like there's literal data to back up this notion, right? The cultural knowledge that you have to be twice as good to get half as far. Mm. Another another stat that's that I like to share. I'm a football fan, um, despite its uh, its issues. Uh, you know, as I played football growing up as well, like I, I think you can learn a lot from the sport. But all the politics aside, right? There's that statistic of like black quarterbacks being benched twice as fast as white quarterbacks, regardless of their quarterback rating, of their on the field statistics. And actually, through those benchings, the teams are actually likely to suffer more after right. that quarterback is benched. So right. even like even despite that, the whole team ends up getting screwed, even though you know you're you're going harder on the uh, the black quarterback. But um, and these and these it's in this, there's stats like this in every industry, right? But I I think. What ends up happening for us, and this, is, and this is what's so challenging, is that like, we end up, I think, accounting for their racism. We have to in order to survive, and we've always you learned have to, to do that. You have to adjust. You have to survive. You have to minimize certain things. Um, yeah, for sure. That's, that's one of the, I think, under, under-recognized issues, like burdens that we deal with and stressors that we deal with being a black employee is that having to account for the racist ideals that exist in the eyes of the other, like we, right. Like we know as black men that, that, that often white folks project their fear onto us and then attack us for the fear that they have of us. So that's why we know to dress a certain way, to speak a certain way, to be above reproach, and to be twice as good, to get half as far, to account for the unfairness, bias, and ease their fear and concern and anxiety. So then they don't un- misunderstand us, experience us as a threat, and then, uh, and then take it out on us in a way that ends up damaging us. But we also have to recognize that we end up incurring a ridiculous burden in the process of doing that. There's such a psycho. There's such a psychological uh, burden that we end up managing right through that double consciousness of of looking through, looking at them. Um, sorry, of looking at ourselves um, through uh, through their eyes, and th- that takes a toll on us. And the thing about that that's the thing about white supremacy and like racism. It grants such a psychological advantage of not having to conform or shift or adjust according to that power dynamic. And uh, we, we've got to recognize that, um, that yes, there's one, that it's not, it's not an exaggeration when we're, when we're told we have to be twice as good to get half as far, that that is incredibly unfair, incredibly stressful, and that it takes a damaging toll. And we have to be able to know that there's a toll to that so that we can recognize when it's really hurting us. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, let's talk about how this climate shifts when everyone's working from home. Yeah, let's go. Let's 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 get into that. All like, right. So is- <laughs> before we do that, you know, I see we have our listeners. So listeners, just comment uh, what state you're in, whether it's Virginia, New York, Jersey, uh, D.C. You know, we just want to have some engagement for sure. Yeah, yeah, and see where everyone's coming from, and also right. uh, about uh, some of your your uh, working from home issues. Right. For sure. So what are, what are your thoughts, man? How, does, how do these things that we deal with, right, the things that we're talking about, like dealing with the, um, dealing with the fears that white folks have of us or the assumptions or projections or um, the scrutiny, like how, do, how does that um, change things for when we are at home, working from yeah, home? Yeah, so um, we're talking performance and underperformance and image and code switching. And I think that at home, that adds a barrier for people. I think, um, for one, code switching, it helps when you're changing environments. It's, I think it's difficult, or you're a little more lax if you're in the comfort of your home. So, you know, if if you're used to being at these uh, meetings with with your colleagues, being in that environment changes something in you. Like you said, you know, you, you, you have the gaze, you're instinctually able to adjust. But I think that being over a, a video conference uh, definitely adds adds a barrier to that, for sure. Yeah, so you feel like for a lot of folks, you're a little bit further removed and makes it a bit easier. Right. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I feel, I feel, I feel two ways about this. I think there's, I think there's been a little bit of that for some people. Like it can feel a little bit more. Well, I, I imagine, yeah, like it, it definitely can feel easier. Um, and also, right now, it's I don't know, like video conferences. You know, I, 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 I had this sense that it it might not change so much in that now a video conference looks like people are invited into your home a bit. Right. Like my, my sense is just as we are like more conscious of how we are presenting ourselves at, at work, depending on your, your experience, your personal uh, experience around your black identity and interaction with white folks. Right. You're, there's that extra layer of thinking of how people are going to think about you. Right. How many of us are extra selective with what we what what is visible in our homes while right. video right. conferencing? Right. So I think I think of that touches to the transparency. Um, transparency equals vulnerability, right? So right. I think that you know, uh, if you're a young professional, you know, you at work, you're you're displaying a certain image. Now, work coming to home and being able to view certain things in, in your home uh, definitely opens up the transparency. I'm not sure if it could be a good thing. I'm sure in some cases it could be a bad thing, um, especially for people who are in environments to where, let's say you're not living living alone. You know, you, you could have your family of origin. You could be like first generation college. It could just be a lot of different um, variables and factors that can impede on like your work performance and what, what your employers see. Yeah, yeah, I, I would think so too. So there's there's also that, right? There's a bit more distractions at home, I think. And in, in terms of what like, um, in terms of what employers see, right? Like, I I can imagine like for be, because there's um, a higher standard and more scrutiny for us. I can imagine like maybe our white counterparts are a little bit more comfortable with kind of appearing on or let's camera. Say your kid is, let's say your kid is screaming or crying, right? Yeah. I think it's different if it's a white person versus if it's a black person. Sure, sure. Right. Uh, I would say also um, for, for, some, for some people, right, they, they'll get right up and go on camera or, and, you know, be in their PJs. Right. But how many black women feel comfortable being on video camera in their bonnet? That's a right. Note. Somebody right. How said, many? Uh, so, Sean woman said she doesn't go on video if she can help it. Right. Not right. <laughs> <laughs> well, th there's this other thing that I was thinking. You know, well, there's right transparency and vulnerability have their merits, but not everyone is worthy of that transparency. And when right. it comes to our interactions with the majority race, right, there are lots of t there are lots of traumatic experiences that we've had with trying to open up. For some people, they don't want to be close to their colleagues on a good day because of the level of scrutiny that they receive. It's it's it's, it's safer to have to have a little distance. To have a little bit of distance, right? You're going to take your time in getting to know your your colleagues. You don't know what side of the aisle they're on, what kind of how if they've been exposed to many black people before in their lives, how they're going to react to you, if they're going to be racist or say something racist. You know, in my in our fields, you know, Norton, like we work around quite a number of, I'm just going to adjust my phone a little bit, quite a number of well-meaning um, white folks. And even our, the well-meaning white folks that we encounter, there's so much that they don't know or don't understand and end up saying things that are racist or objectify you or, put you, or hurt you in ways that are familiar and demeaning, right? So there's often this guard, right? Like things are good until they ain't. And a lot of the times you don't even get to where it's good. So then when people are like in your homes, you know, there's that distance. So when you go off video, like you can chill, you can relax, you can woosa. So I feel you on that, right? You can relax a little bit. But at, at the same time, I also imagine, right? Like we, we were mentioning earlier, right? Like black folks being the first to be fired often like when we're not in a recession we're heading into a lot of economic uncertainty now I, I i imagine that for a lot of us right with this with the that mantra of having to be twice as good to get half as far a lot of the times we we base and i think this is true for everyone we based on how far we make it on like how good we are 
if we were good enough, if we are twice as good, then maybe we're worthy to go. Right. right? And we got to acknowledge that it's, that it's twice as hard in the first place. But then right. sometimes we can feel like if we're twice as good, then we're good enough to go. And if we don't go, then, we're, then we weren't good enough. And that can turn into we are what we do. We are only what we can produce. Right? right. So there's this perfectionism that, that, that starts to seep in that, you know, and our self-worth can just become based on what we put out. You combine that Which with all the things we've been taking advantage of. Absolutely. And you combine that with all the things that we've been talking about. Right. Like, I think for a lot of us wor working from home, there can be an extra stressor to overproduce, to um, be overproductive to kind of demonstrate, hey, like, I don't want to lose my job. I'm feeling more pressure right now. I just want to know, hey, uh, Mr. Boss Man, Mr. Boss Lady, I'm, I'm producing my work. I just want you to know my black behind is at home at a desk, at a computer. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm not taking no additional liberties. I don't want to give you no additional reason to uh, consider me as the next person to be laid off or furloughed or to consider right. me as an, ex, um, as an expense, right? And I, so I, I imagine for us that even in addition to being able to chill and relax a little bit while at home, in between the, the, the video conferences or the calls uh, and being able to be in the comfort of your own, like the, I, I imagine there's also an extra pressure to prove that you are worthy of the position that you, that you should not be the next person to lose their job. Because we know that we're often the first to go and we often don't have to give any reason at all. So I imagine there could be additional pressures in other areas as well. Right, I see some people are saying that's all the way 100. So Clarence Todd, shout out Clarence Todd. Um, Serenity Seekers 404 says bingo. Uh, Easy New York, shout out Easy New York. What's up Hampton? Uh, Fax, uh, what is it? Gelver, New York. Uh, how can we use this time? All right, so we're gonna get into questions in a few. Yeah, let's 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 hold on to that one, but we okay. can get into some questions real soon. Okay. Um, and I and I I agree. Um, Hop Esquire says we're always walking on eggshells, right? Like there's just always sense that you can't quite let your guard down. Don't right? do too like, much of this. Don't do too little of that. You gotta find somewhere. You're in the not, room. especially if you're young. Especially if you're young, because um, from my experience. When we reach these professional, um, you know, uh, accolades that we want to have, typically, especially being black, you could be young, black, and your, your counterparts are, you know, middle-aged white folks. So it's already a generational uh, difference. There's already some underlying, um, I don't want to say issues, but views. So just yeah. being able to kind of navigate in that, in that um, climate could be taxing, especially if, if you're at home. Uh, I Absolutely. think that it could be a relief. For, it could be a relief for some people, you know, when you're at work, putting on your work hat. Now, when you leave, you're able to kind of to to leave it there and change. But being able to have every, being able to to blend the two in the comfort of your home could definitely present a lot of challenges. Yeah, I'm I'm still also thinking about what you were saying earlier about um, the feeling like there's a sweet spot in terms of durability, mm -hmm. and there's. But if seven, you do, six, seven, you, all right? you you do too well, then you know the white folks might feel uncomfortable. If you don't do well enough, right, then you get the axe. And really, to me, what that is about is good enough to not upset their ego, and not um, bad enough to to set up the 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 mentality of white supremacy of them being better than us right which is the psychological advantage right good enough to not force them to confront the fallacy of their psychological advantage but not bad enough to then lose a job and it's right. it's like it's like trying to um it's it's like trying to you know thread a needle and it's an incredible amount of stress and i think when you when you're working from home again you know you don't have that face time with the boss you don't have that those moments where you can pull someone aside and say like hey can we chat really quick can we right. you know um i just want you to um i just want you i just want to make sure that you know that i'm doing my job well right for um, sure. so it's tough man i think it's, it's tough. tough for sure i it's also want to say really 
I also wanted to say really quickly that um, um, I also want to say really quickly that we're not just working from home. You're not allowed to go into work because we're in the middle of a global crisis. Right. That's different. Right. Right. You're you're working uh, from home during a global crisis during an unprecedented time. So that's a different context. You're not just kind of like chilling out at home. Like I think we all, we need to we constantly need to acknowledge that the the amount that we're dealing with and addressing, so that we don't pretend like we should be performing at a level that's not actually. Um, that's not actually realistic for the context that we're in. We're being too hard on ourselves. Um, and that we don't forgive ourselves for the amount of like things that we have tugging on us, right? We're, we're all dealing with an immense amount of stress and immense amount of challenge. And, and so we carry that with us even in our homes, right? You're not allowed to go into work. That's different from kind of just working from home, like a luxury, like one or two day a week. No, like we, we can't go to work because we're in the middle of a crisis. So wor you're working during a crisis. And I, I think it's important that we keep that in mind because that does weigh on the stress levels. No, for sure, for sure. So we have some comments. You want to go to questions? Um, do you, do you want to talk real quickly just about how we can cope about some of the stuff? And then maybe yeah. we'll go to... And folks, you guys start leaving questions. Um, Norton, I'll let you start off with just, uh, just some ideas about coping and then we can switch in the, to questions. Yeah, I'd say, well, the, the biggest thing that helps people cope, um, if you are in a toxic work environment, I see some people saying they're going hard regardless. Shout out, Rico. I see Kenny saying that. Um, I feel the same, Rico. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I see Kenny saying that, um, you know, whatever uh, adverse the, his white counterparts have is their personal problem. So depending on your work environment, we're not saying all work environments are like this, uh, but I think one of the, the, the main uh, what, not the main, but one of the primary ways to cope is being able to socialize with your coworkers outside of the Zoom meetings, whether that's group chats or phone calls or things like that. Sometimes your coworkers uh, are the only ones that understand the stresses of work. Um, you know, your family may not understand, your friends may not understand, but uh, if you do have coworkers that you can trust and are connected with, just being able to connect with them and kind of creating that support system is going to be really, really important. I'll say uh, two things really quickly. We all know, um, uh, Norton, you've, you've been really active about telling folks to like have an agenda while working from home. Like that's really useful. And using the regular coping strategies that a lot of people have, like mindfulness, going for walks, exercise, eating right, taking care of yourself, right? The self-care things. A couple things I want to add to that. One, I'll say um, if... Uh, I think a lot of times we confuse respect and esteem and um, we shouldn't, you know, we all deserve to be respected. We all deserve to be treated fairly. If someone doesn't treat you well or doesn't respect you, um, then they don't, you, you shouldn't have to earn their respect. Esteem right. is something you earned, right? Respect is not something you earn. You're, we all deserve respect no matter who you are. And that's something that I learned from my good guy, Denzel, um, from a project that I'll, that I'll be shouting out at the end of our time today. I thought you were about to say Washington. I'm going to fall out the chair now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was um, no, that's from one of his sense. movies. No, no, no. Uh, I'm going to shout out a project of his that, that I'm going to be working on very, very soon. But, uh, but yeah, like, you know, respect and esteem are not the same thing. We often confuse that because we have to work so hard in order to be recognized. And we've been fighting for respect all our lives. Black folks have been fighting to be treated as humans since we were black Americans, right? Since we, right. Since, we since the beginning of this country. Right. Um, and so we often conflate the two, but we should not have to earn respect. So if someone is not respecting you, just know that's not about you and that's about them. Um, and you can let that go. And don't own that, and don't let that's that be a reflection of your ability. Said so they reject that, yeah, reject that. Um, last thing I'll say is that you know when you're working from home, a lot of us are feeling undermotivated, a lot of us are feeling drained and more tired than usual. I think Marquis' suggestion about um, having a set agenda can really help with that. Right. But um, 
you know, task, the tasks are very important. Being able yeah. To yeah. But just just know that it's going to be a little bit harder to be motivated, especially if you're not used to working from home, that your productivity level actually may come down a little bit. Right. And that's mm -hmm. and that's kind of the way things can go for a lot of people that are forced to work from the comfort of their home rather than being at work, which forces you into this sort of get up and go mode. So if you're using less energy, you may be a little bit more tired as well. Um, and so. Um, to that end, I would say, uh, you know, try to have separate spaces for where you work and where you chillax. Like, you know, if you're going to chill out on the couch or on your bed, right? I, I'm a big believer of the bed should only be used for sleeping. That's just good uh, sleep hygiene. But um, if you chill on the couch, don't work at the couch, right? Work at the table, right? Or if you chill at the table, don't work at the table. Set up a little, like, space where you can, um, where you can work. And kind of separating the two can help, like, separate the mindsets. Change your environment. Just right, changing the environment a bit. So that's it. I, I think there's more tips that we could provide, but we want to give you guys some time to ask, some time to ask questions. So please do leave questions. Why don't we Why don't we scroll, uh, Mar Marquis? If you want to um, take the first question, we can kind of just scroll to see what questions we might um, we might. What um, are your thoughts on by? calling out from work from home? Hey, as an employee, you have certain liberties. You know, you have sick time, you have personal time. Uh, me personally, I always use it. You, if you don't, if you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, I would say, you know, uh, in whatever system you're in, uh, you know, don't take advantage of the system. But if you, if you need a mental health day, uh, you know, if, if you're not feeling up to par, if you're able to to take uh, time off, you know, I, I certainly uh, second that for sure. Absolutely. I, there's there's not, really not much for me to add to that, but um, just that, you know, if you're sick uh, or you're burnt out, that doesn't just stop happening just because you're at home. Right. Right. You won't be any more productive just because you're at home if you're not feeling great, right. uh, depending on who you are and how you work. Right. So the need mental health days, you know, uh, take a day, you know, you, you got to do what you what you have to do. Uh, easy, what you have to do. Uh, easy New York says, uh, can we speak on white people using black vernacular in the workplace that blacks can't use themselves? Like, I need more specifics. Yeah, can you add some more details on that? Maybe we yeah, can give, come back give around. Some examples, Ian. Yeah, maybe we can come back around to that one. Right. Uh, somebody, all right, so somebody said, calling out from home, I could definitely took last Friday off. I right, shout you out, uh, Charnay woman. Uh, both wife and I are working from home, spending so much time together. It's making me even more claustrophobic at home. Any suggestion for couples sharing the workspace? I think we talked about that a little before. Um, just kind of being able to create that routine for your family. Um, so, you know, I have two little ones. My wife, she's still going to work, but if it was a work from home situation, I would assume that we would do something like I may take the kids around the block while she's trying to work and just try to hand off because sometimes if you're kind of in the space together and you have your work stressors, they have their work stressors, and you're just trying to, um, you know, uh, make things make things fit. But I think everyone's trying to find out what the norm is, but just creating that routine to where you guys are balancing off the work responsibilities with the home responsibilities. Absolutely. To add to that, wow, we've got some really good questions. And I want to go back up to our guy Gulliver um, in a moment to answer his question. We'll go to then Hop Esquire and then Ian provided some more context. So to add to that as well, so, uh, Serenity Seeker, um, I'll, I'll say, say you know, what would you say? No, I was laughing at Ian's comments. So okay. Like, What's good? My bad. I'm all good. Okay. <laughs> Uh, to, to add to, uh, to this serenity uh, seeker, I would say that, um, you know, it's, it's really hard. I'm putting on my, my uh, couples counselor hat a little bit. It's really hard for a lot of couples to communicate effectively around the things that they need, emotionally, physically, or otherwise, right? Uh, deep down, a lot of us have fears that if we really say what it is that we're desiring or needing, that our partner isn't going to respect it. Their feelings are going to be hurt. We're going to do something damaging. There'll be irreparable separation or perhaps repairable separation, but there'll just be lots of conflict um, that's unwanted, right? 
And I think for a lot of couples, we, uh, you're, you're challenged with trying to navigate those issues um, or just, just gaps in communication that are always there for every single couple, but they've been exacerbated a little bit more because you're with each other every single waking moment. I'm getting a bitch saying the echo from my phone is getting a little bad, so I'm going to take out my, my earbud. Um, so I would say that um, you, you, you want to, as much as you can, try to communicate with your, partners, uh, your partner about what it is that you need, including time apart, when you need time apart or space for yourself, because you're navigating such a small space that's really important that you be able to communicate effectively with one another around the things that you may be wanting and needing. Um, and, you know, know that it's not always going to be the same thing. You're going to want different things. Maybe your partner is a little bit hurt by that and you guys can have conversations about that, but both of you will need to be able to tolerate the fact that you'll be needing different things at different times and be able to address those disappointments and make space for those disappointments while also being able to nego negotiate what it is that we need. All right, for sure. Okay. Um, let's see. All right, maybe Burma. All right, so what Ian was referring to was terms like what's good, my bad, what's up. Uh, so white counterparts using those terms. And I think that falls back to what we were saying before, how uh, things that we do tend to be heightened. So, you know, if your white counterpart says, you know, what's good or my bad, you know, it's, it's, it's no big deal. However, if, you know, a black coworker says, what's good or my bad, you know, he turns into uh, uh, <laughs> 50 cent or something like that. You know, it, it, it's, it's <laughs> and I think, I think that's just undermine um, systemic, I don't want to call it racism, but definitely judgment, you know. The, like, for instance, if I'm at work, if I jump with basketball, it's like, oh, my God, he plays basketball? He's so, you know, it's, 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 the same, it's the same way, I think, for sure. I would, I would also say to that that um, uh, I'm reminded of this episode of The Office where they thought Stanley could play basketball and he was awful at it. And uh, anyway, you're, when you mentioned basketball, it just really <laughs> reminded me of that, right? Stereotypes. Right, stereotypes, exactly. Right, Falls right, right. You know, Ian, depending on the colleague and whether I was comfortable with them, I might say, you know, because I'm, I'm a, <laughs> I, I'm personally, I, I don't self-disclose much on, on these things, but what I will say is that I'm not one to kind of, uh, I don't want to suffer in silence. Um, I don't agree with that. I think there's an aspect of respectability politics in that, and I I like making my voice known and I'll deal with the chips as they fall, you know, and I'm re always respectful when I do, but I think I would fi probably find a way if it was really bothering me and I was coming away heated, angry, and just enraged, depending on who you are, right? I might say to that colleague, you know, I could never get away with saying that. You know, I could never like, if I said something like that, it, be pretty weird for people you know that right right and just you know it and maybe it starts a dialogue maybe they take offense but um i think it'll uh it will allow me to deal with my emotions in a way that i think is appropriate and also allows me to get it out rather than um kind of intensify within right i want to go to a uh, gulliver who said he says scratch his first question i thought it was a good question um, but he says, uh, as a manager, holding people accountable, yet being empathic and not being an ass has been hard. How do I shift? So I think I, I may be able to, because, uh, you know, as a professor, we have students. Um, so, you know, there are certain expectations. I think that empathy is, is the, the most important thing. Um, you know, obviously, we can't wash the whole semester away. However, you know, I understand that, you know, being flexible with deadlines, um, you know, understanding people's people's stories, understanding their concerns. Uh, I think that it needs to be a balance of, you know, understanding with accountability, right? So the understanding could be, you know, checking in with your with your team, making sure everyone's good, you know, Wi-Fi access, how's the family, health, all that stuff. 
But then on the flip side, it's like, hey, you know, I know you have all this stuff going on, but these are some deadlines we're working on. So I would say definitely trying to have that uh, collaborative uh, managerial style is going to be uh, very, very important. Yeah, to, to add to that, um, you know, just knowing that everyone's going to respond to things differently, uh, you know, and it can be hard when you are comparing traumas, comparing sufferings, right? Like I imagine it may be a little bit more challenging to empathize with someone who loses their dog right now. Mm -hmm. while people are losing like mothers, fathers, sons, brothers, right. uh, children, right? Um, so just know that it will, it's, it's hard to um, empathize with everything and um, that you're gonna have different reactions to different experiences. And so you may be saying to, thinking to yourself, well, I wouldn't have allowed myself to be impacted by that like this, or I wouldn't have reacted like that. This would have never impacted my productivity in this manner. That may be true, but you're also not them. And so if you're wanting to be empathetic during this time, I would ask questions, um, more and more questions, just to, to try to understand what's going on with you that you had that um, experience, what's going on with you that this happened. It isn't like you, right? If there's a change in behavior. It isn't like you for something like this to happen. To happen. I'm wondering what's going on with you. And so it's and what can I do to have a personal you? connection with them and to really um, access some empathy. What was that, Norton? No, I'll say also, what, what can you do to help, if anything? You know, sure, like, sure, sure. Connecting sure. people to resources and things like that. Is, is Absolutely. Really beneficial. Yeah. So it looks like we have a lot of questions. You want to do like two more, or what are you thinking? Yeah, we, we All can. Right. All right. Uh, which, why don't you choose one? I'll choose one as well. All right, Shaka. All right. Um, so question cut off. Hope it makes sense. All right. She says, uh, and first of all, appreciate everyone for commenting, you know. This uh, is awesome, actually. Yeah, this yeah, is we're awesome. gonna we're gonna run out of time in our live, actually. I don't know if you wanna come back on or not, but I um all right. there. I know you I know you got kids. <laughs> yeah, I got the little ones. They're gonna be tripping in a second. All right, so can we discuss dealing with guilt related to family members unemployment or lack of resources at this time and feeling responsible to provide? or personal success while people are people around you are hurting got it so i mean i think guilt is a is a strong emotion um i think that right now the world is trying to figure a lot of things out but how do we deal with the guilt of family members or our support system not having um certain resources that's the question i think what do you think, yep. um, Well, I, I think guilt implies that you're doing something wrong, right? It's it's never wrong to feel what it, what is genuinely felt, you know. Um, so you're you're human. You're allowed to have the range of emotions that come with any of any experience, whatever it may be, whatever the circumstance or context. Um, how you feel is how you feel. So. If you're one of the few people who is uh, thriving during this time, or you're you're having a, a successful um, some some sort of accolade or achievement, something um, has come to fruition right during this time, right? It can be hard to to celebrate, and you want to be mindful of what other people are experiencing. Kids are actually really really talented at this. They're mindful of their parents. Um, feelings and they'll adapt their responses to their own achievements accordingly like if they know their parents are in a good mood they won't be as happy as something that they achieve so that's something that's like deeply ingrained in us and i would say that you know you have allow yourself the space to feel what you feel if you're not as comfortable as celebrating in front of everybody celebrate for yourself right you can be mindful of what other people are feeling while also uh being like it's okay for you to both mourn for them and to um, celebrate to yourself. Really yourself. Yeah. yeah. And I would also say a lot of times with finances, guilt um, comes into play uh, with certain expectations. So if there are, so let's say you have family members who are, you know, expecting certain things from you or, you know, uh, leaning on you as a, as a support system, it may not hurt to have those, those conversations, um, you know, trying to set some healthy boundaries. Obviously, 
support is support. We want to help each other out, but you you don't want to be depleted um, from from you know. I, I agree. Yeah, and and um, we're gonna get cut off in like four minutes. But I want to combine two questions because I think there's something in there uh, that applies to both. Uh, Miss Handful T uh, says, "How do you cope with and be forgiving?" of oneself when you are not meeting personal work expectations due to remote working and may hop honey spice there is relation there my cousin oh what's up um, uh i am looking for your question again there's something about oh there it is can we talk about empowering parents who may be distracted or feel inadequate professionally due to parenting while working, right? So both both of you are expressing some concerns about efficiency and productivity and being able to um, 